host Wendy Sparks. Today I have the utmost pleasure to speak with the lovely WNBA legend Miss Kim Hampton who had a great 15-year career overseas and then with the WNBA with the New York Liberty. Kim, welcome. Thank you, Wendy. I'm so honored to finally get to do this um, interview. I wish I was there in Canada, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so pleased you have you on the show today as you are bringing uh, a different dynamic to the listeners and can educate us about playing professional basketball as a woman. So tell us, where does your story begin? Wow. Well, um, I just remember growing up being extremely shy because I was always taller than all of my peers, but it wasn't until my freshman year of high school that I actually started participating in organized sports. That was basketball. And then after my freshman year, the season was over, the basketball season, uh, the track coach asked me if I would throw the shot put. And, and because, um, you know, I had garnered some, I guess, some self-esteem and I was kind of feeling good about myself, um, I decided that I would participate in the track in field and uh, I threw the shot put and won the state championship and stuff like that. So that's where it, that's where it all began. Wow. So tell me, how did sports help you grow at that time uh, in your life as a young teenage girl? Well, uh, again, it, it helped me exponentially because I was, again, extremely shy. When I got to high school, I was six feet tall. Um, and, you know, that was really tall back then. <laughs> Um, I graduated from high school in 80, so that was pretty tall. And um, yeah. I just it, it just helped me. It gave me more of a voice. Uh, it helped me to see my um, self-worth and, and the value that I brought to the table. Um, and it just, you know, overall, better body image. Um, I appreciated the fact that I was tall, uh, you know, and things like that, especially playing against taller players or tough players. You know, you kind of start saying, whoa glad I was tall yeah <laughs> you know but, <laughs> but you know so all of those wonderful things I think um and you know and it just continued to help me throughout my uh throughout my career as well once I got to college there was a whole different beast of, of things that I learned and then even playing professional and stuff okay so your basketball talents in high school landed you recruitment letters from various schools various colleges what was it like to have options to choose where you were going to play next? It was really, really wonderful. Um, I, when I, by the time I was a senior, I was the top female basketball player in the state of Kentucky because I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. And I was also the top shot putter in the state of Kentucky because I won the state championships that year as well. And so, um, just having the option to go to college on a scholarship uh, in track and basketball was cool. It was pretty cool. And then I was recruited by all of the top schools in the nation as well. So it was just a wonderful feeling, which also helps in the, the esteem, you know, and everything because it was kind of like, wow. <laughs> you know, so it was pretty cool. <laughs> so why did you choose Arizona State? Um, you know, it's so funny because you're right, because I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. You have the University of Louisville there. You have the University of Kentucky there. But when you grow up around it all of your life, I mean, some people chose to stay, but I was just more adventurous. I just knew that the world was a bigger and better place. And I just wanted to, I wanted to see and explore. And also, um, Tennessee was, you know, it's the next state below Kentucky. And I was, you know, they always had a great program. And so I was being heavily recruited by them. But the problem was, I didn't know and understand because women's basketball in 1980 wasn't big. It, it hadn't even gone to NCAA yet. I think it was the last year of the AIAW. So schools weren't allowed to fly us out on visits 
And I didn't get a chance to see women's basketball on television and things like that. So I really was blind. And with me being such a, a newcomer to the sport, you know, I don't think my high school coach, my high school coach went to an HBCU. And so I think he was, well, he was pushing me to go to his school, <clears throat> but, um, but he was, I mean, and not heavily, but I just didn't know. We didn't know. He wanted me to go wherever I wanted to go. So I just decided I want to go see something different. So I was looking at schools like, you know, Arizona State. I was looking at schools that had big, beautiful campuses where the weather was kind of warm. I was looking at schools in Florida, <laughs> looking at schools in California. And somehow I don't, I can't even tell you why or how. But it just, it was just Arizona State. I mean, it was literally like me closing my eyes and pulling something out of a hat. That's just pretty much how it was. It was like a any mini money mo situation. <laughs> pretty much. I'm telling you pretty cool much. With the yeah. best son. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. It got you where you are where you where you are today. So A bad for your your option, right? Well, um, the craziest that did, but just to, just to add to that, the craziest uh-huh. thing was Arizona State wasn't known to be a basketball school. Right. And again, because I was very young, I, you know, I was I didn't understand that, okay, you're one of the top players in the nation. You should go to a top basketball school, you know, because that right. could mean Olympic team. That could mean so many opportunities. So I didn't know that. But fate would have it that my coach happened to have been the co-captain on the 76 Olympic team with Pat Head Summit. And so, you know, I was able to be trained um, and coached by someone who knew exactly what it would take, you know, to be one of the top players in the nation and knew how to build a program. So, Right. So Arizona State University, um, you had a great four-year stint with them. You played twice in the Sweet 16, and till this day, 30 years later, you are the all-time leading scorer and rebounder with 2,361 points, 1,400 rebounds. You must be so proud of yourself. Tell me about that. <laughs> you know, while you're going through it, it's happening. You don't even know it. And then after the fact, you look at the numbers, and it's kind of like, whoa, I did that? Really? <laughs> and what I think more so what I'm proud of is that's the record for male or female, you know. So, um, you know, so I, I'm really so proud that, um, you know, I I was able to push through because it was really tough. Our coach was, well, my coach was really tough. I know two occasions that I really and truly wanted to pack my bags and go home because, I mean, she was just so mentally tough on us and physically tough. and. You know, I'm so glad that I stayed because, you know, some of the lessons that I learned as far as, you know, when you think you've, you've given all that you have, it's always more. It's It really is always more. It's, you know, and that we give up sometimes so easily, you know, we want to tap out and we still have more to go. And, and you know, and, and it's everything is just perception and then working. I mean, you know, we all want the accolades. We want to be the best player, but... You know, in order to be the best player, you got to put on that those overalls and that work hat, you know, to get it. You know, sure. it's just not going to show up at your front door. So, um, you know, I'm I'm glad I stuck it out. But uh, it was, you know, and then once it was over and said and done, you know, I looked back and I was like, wow, you know, I did that. Well, I yeah, I can see where you're coming from because back then, organized sports for women there there were like very few so as a woman you have more to prove as a female athlete oh my gosh we were pretty much doing it for the love of it because i mean again and you know there wasn't even professional uh uh, professional um basketball in america for women so we were literally doing it for the love of the game did you have i guess you didn't have then any female athletes to look up to or anyone that was breaking barriers then nah well the only only you know all we saw during that time um uh, uh on television was tennis and golf for women um and then i remember you know billy jean king was doing big things for women uh back then but as far as basketball i never i didn't see anyone uh, when i got to high school when i was probably a freshman in high school uh there was a girl that lived up the street from me, Valerie Owens, she was doing big things, and she ended up going to the University of Louisville, but um, 
you know, you're right. It wasn't any female role models. So uh, my brother played basketball as well, and we would watch basketball games together. And I and I just kind of took a liking to the post players because they played my position, and and uh, and it just seemed more familiar to me. Right. So you graduated from Arizona State in '84, and you had a BA in theater. Awesome. As for basketball, there still weren't any pro women's league in the U.S., um, so you had to go to Europe. Were you okay with that decision as that meant you were going clear across the world to a completely different country with different cultures and languages? Like, were you, were you afraid to do that, to take that step? No, I wasn't at all. So, you know, first of all, you have to know if I was – if I was right out of high school going clear across the country to go to Arizona State, you know, I definitely had some, <laughs> I had some, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, just uh, exploratory uh, uh, <laughs> nerves about myself or just, you know, I had that, that exploratory gift, you know, I guess, or just adventurous side to want to explore and see the world. So I was looking forward to it. I was super excited uh, to go. and. Um, and so I actually met the agent who placed me overseas. I was one of the, when I, when I was a senior in college, I was one of the uh, Wade Trophy finalists. And that's where they picked the top 50 kids in the state. I mean, in the United States. And then they, it's, and so the Margaret Wade Trophy, I was up for the Margaret Wade Trophy. It's, it's the equivalent of the highest the trophy, but it's for women's basketball. It's called the Margaret Wade Trophy. So I was one of the 50 finalists and they flew us all to New York. So we had this big, it was this big, you know, ceremony banquet, and then they, you know, they named who the, the the winner was and everything. So I wasn't the winner, but I got an opportunity to meet an agent who was ready to uh, find me a job overseas. And so uh, we we talked, and you know, I signed papers with him and everything. And in about a month, he told me he called me up and said, because I was back in Kentucky at that time, he says, Kim, you ready to find out where you're going? I was like, yeah. And he was like, well, you're going to go to Spain. I was like, okay. He's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And when I was saying, yeah. um, were you afraid, I get that you went from Louisville to Arizona, but I guess my whole thing is, why are you going to a different country now where you don't even speak the language? So tell me, I how know. did you pick up the language when you went to Spain for you those know, six years? <laughs> Yeah, you know what it is, is when that's all you are around, you'd be surprised. I mean, now, if you've got an open mind, because I know there was, there was some Americans that went over there, and they had no interest in picking up the language. They kind of didn't really like it and enjoy it. But I've always been the type of person, if I'm going to go somewhere, I'm going to engulf myself in the culture. You know, I want to eat the food. I'm not going there looking for hamburgers and, and Coca-Cola, you know. So <laughs> so I would go to my teammates' homes, and they would invite me over to lunch or dinner or on holidays and things like that. And so just being around it, and I wanted to learn. So one of the first words I learned was, como se dice? It means, like, how do you say how do you this? Say? You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, how do you say? And so I was always saying that. And so uh, I just really wanted to learn. And then one day it just clicked for me. So you played a total of 12, 12 years overseas, six in Spain. Twelve and a half. Oh, okay. That half makes a difference. My bad. <laughs> no, yeah. <here. laughs> so six in uh, Spain, four in Italy, uh, a year each in Japan and France. When mm -hmm. leaving from one country to another, um, did you feel like you were sort of starting all over again because you're going from one way of life to a next? Like, was the transition difficult for you? Well, it was not because of who I am. I, again, I, I yeah. consider myself a very outgoing and open person and an optimistic person. So I would always embrace every new place that I would go to and and the people were open as well. So um, it, it really wasn't. The only difference is that it was was getting used to, you know, learning new names of all of your teammates and getting mm -hmm. used to a new coach. Um, but the culture in Europe was pretty much, you know, the same. It was very similar. Um, uh, and, you know, it was just getting used to, like, your coach, you know, like the coaching style, right. getting used to the league because some, you know, like one league was tougher than the other. The Italian league was tougher than the Spanish league at the time, you know, and stuff like that. So it was just small adjustments like that. But for the most part, 
you know, it was pretty much the same. It wasn't, it wasn't that bad. And of course, learning a new language, having to start all over there, that was, that was a little difficult. While playing overseas, back home in the U.S., things were still happening for you as you were later inducted into the Arizona State Hall of Fame in 1989 as a female athlete. How exciting was that? Oh, that was really awesome. Uh, You know, I I remember uh, it was during a football game. And um, I want to say it was homecoming. And so it was nice. You know, I was just inducted into the, 80, the class of 89 and so just getting a chance to, to go back after playing overseas and seeing everybody. It was, it was really wonderful. In 96, the late David Stern founded the WNBA League, which was slated at that time to start in spring of in 97. How did you hear about that? Well, um, in the spring of 96, I was still in Italy, and um, I remember we were playing in Parma. We were playing, we had just finished playing the game, and one of the players, Andrea, um, she asked me if I wanted, if I would be interested and want to play in this professional league, this new professional league that they were going to start in America, and it was going to start in 96 after the Olympics. So I, I was like, well, can I have, you know, the contract? Can I have everything? She's like, no, I can't give them now. She said, but I will call you later on. Speak with your agent, and I'll call you later on uh, in the week. And I said, oh, okay. So I contacted my agent, and I was like, hey, Bruce. I was like, you know, Andrea, she reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to play in this new league. They're going to start right after the Olympics. And he's like, no, 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 no. He said, that's the ABL. He said, don't do it. And I said, well, I was like, why? They're offered this six-feature contract. So I was like, I could play over in Europe and then go back and play during the summer over there. I'm like, why not? You know? And so he was like, no. He said, well, we're not allowed to say anything, but I'm just going to let you know because the NBA is going to be starting a league, the WNBA. And, you know, so that's the one that you're going to play in. It's going to have the backing of the NBA. And it's going to be, you're going to play in the NBA arenas. And it's going to be, and I was like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, but it's not going to start until 97. I was like, Bruce, are you sure? You know, so he was like, yes, I promise you. <laughs> so that's how I found out about it. And then not only that, um, you know, I also found out that, um, and then that's when they started sending a scout over to see the games because they had to, okay. you know, fill the rosters. So they had the collegiate players, but they knew that there were great players that had already graduated from college that were abroad still playing. So they sent a scout out, you know, that was just going from country to country, watching game after game. And so I never will forget her name is Renee Brown. She actually came over and she saw our game. And we happened to, we were the number three team in Italy at that time. And we happened to be playing against the number one team. So it was like, oh yeah, great. Now we have, you know, she's going to come to this game. <laughs> but, we, but we played them to the last second, you know, I mean, they beat us at the final second, you know, and my teammate, Michelle, Edwards, who happens to be the, uh, she's an assistant coach at Rutgers University now, but uh, under Vivian Stringer, um, she she had a great game. I had a great game, and so we found out that both of us would be drafted in the elite draft, and so uh, it was it was pretty cool. So tell us what's the difference between between the regular draft and the elite draft. Well. The elite draft was the draft that they had, the Olympians, the 96 Olympics. So that was uh, 96 Olympians. That was like Rebecca Lobo, Lisa Leslie, Cheryl Swoops, you know, like all of the the, the elite players. And, and so then they picked a handful that did not play on the Olympic team, like myself and, you know, some of the other players. And so then they had the drafts between us. So we were, all of us were the first people on the teams. We were like the first four people on the teams and the regular draft made up the, uh, the rest of the roster. So, and then those players had to go to the combine that was held at Disney world. And, you know, they had to, you know, for like three days, they had to be, they were put through drills and everything. And so all of us, you know, we got, we got to go to Disney world and just kind of watch and hang out and vacation while they were doing the combine and everything. So that was the difference. <laughs> And so we and we got like automatic yeah and I think we had guaranteed automatic contracts you know we were on the team you know so it's a few other perks you know that went along with that to be in the league yeah. So at the age of 36, you were drafted fourth overall to the New York Liberty. What were you feeling when you realized like hold on a second I'm actually going back to the U.S. now to play? 
I was super excited because I, you know, I just kind of felt like, oh my God, finally, we're going to be playing in America. Finally, I've been playing for 15 years. My family, you know, everyone knows that Kim plays bas- professional basketball, but finally my family and friends are going to get a chance to see me play. You know, and then, oh, my gosh, we're going to be playing in NBA arenas. And, you know, just the thought of it, you know, was really exciting. But I still couldn't and didn't fathom or just just I, I couldn't even couldn't even have imagined what it was actually like until I got there. And it was crazy. I mean, we had when that when the WNBA started, we were like rock stars. Oh, yeah. And I tell you. Yeah, when I tell you celebrities, I mean, from, you know, Jamie <laughs> Fox, you know, Gregory Hines, uh, uh, Queen Latifah, I mean, Tyler Banks, I'll be sure, all the music celebrities and stuff. I mean, anybody, everybody was, like, welcoming to us. I mean, actors and actresses, you know, um, singers, I mean, model, everybody. We were, like, rock stars. We could... Get in and come. They like, oh, you know, oh my God, that's killer. I don't true like it. I mean, it was amazing. I, I was just like, oh my God, I've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> I could only imagine the hype and the build up and the, the limelight leading up to the actual beginning of the season. The first WNBA slogan was, we got next. So when during the NBA, you know, it was still, as the season was getting ready to start, you went at least. During one NBA game, we got next. The commercial, a commercial would come on, or a slogan. The slogan we got next would come on during our NBA game at least eight times. So you <laughs> knew the WNBA was happening. So it was yeah. just amazing. So the big night comes now. It is June twenty first, nineteen ninety seven, and you realize that you were about to make history, and you were to play in the very first WNBA game ever. You were about to put on your brand new uniform for the very first time. I'm sure players had on their new kicks and more. Walk me through the locker room with the ladies. Like, what was the atmosphere like? Oh, baby, it started before the locker room. It started at the hotel <laughs> when we had to put on our sweatsuits, you know, and stuff like that, and, you know, and head. Um, we we actually we got dressed at the um, at the hotel and. When we got on the bus, to, you know, when we boarded the bus to take us to the Great Western Forum, because that's where it was played. You know, and everyone was just eerily quiet. You know, we just didn't know how to take it because we had been out in California for a week because all of the publicity and we had the media, we had, you know, every we, it was just so much to do before the first game. So we were there, you know, both well, L.A. was there automatically. But we were there a week before because we had commercials to shoot. We had interviews to do. We had, you know, just the hype and the buildup. So when we finally pull up to the Great Western Forum, you know, you have to drive down and underground for that. You know, we would saw fans at the entranceway on both sides, you know, cheering the bus hall, yay, you know, just, and I mean, <laughs> just, it was amazing. It was like, oh my gosh, with signs and everything. But when we get down underground and the bus comes to a stop, paparazzi, when I tell you it had to have been like a hundred paparazzi, I mean, the media was on leak. I was like, what? <laughs> oh my God, we're getting off it. we're getting off the bus and the lights and everything. You know, Kim, Kim, how do you feel about this game? You know, shoving microphones in your face. I mean, we it was just like, oh my God. Wow. And then when we got in the locker room, I had a moment because I was like, oh my God. I was like, think about all of the butt of the great players that have come through here. <laughs> So I, so I made sure I sat in every stall. I sat in every stall and rubbed my butt around in it a little bit. And I was like, and then I said, so by osmosis, I was going to get all of the great skills of all of the great players that had ever, you know, oh, sat in those stalls. <laughs> you know, and everything. And so then I laced up, you know, and everything and went out and I was shooting around. And it was just amazing because I had, you know, I, the arena just seemed so big, and there was so much media out there, and it was just—it yeah. was scary. We were on a—we were on 
just an emotional roller coaster. You know, one minute we were hyped and excited, yeah, let's go. And then the next minute we were like nervous, like, oh my God, we're going to be playing against thousands of people. Like, this people with 20,000 people, like, oh my God. You know, and then, oh my God, you know, we're on national TV, TV, CBS. They're like, oh my God, like, the whole world's going to be watching. Oh my God, we were a mess. I mean, when I tell you, we were a mess. <laughs> Then you had to get through the ceremony stuff. You know, you had to do the yeah. ceremonial tip off so that they could take pictures, you know, and everything. And then it was finally game time. I mean, I think we were so scared. We just wanted to play. We're just like, come on, can we get over with it already? But it was just, you know, all of the hype surrounding it and all of the ceremonial stuff that you had to get through. Right. So it was just, whew. So as the first center of the New York Liberty, you were blessed with the very first tip-off, of the WNBA alongside Lisa Leslie of the Los Angeles Sparks. You also mm-hmm. scored the very first two points ever for the Liberty. So you, my dear, yep. made so much history just on that one game alone. Looking back at it now, do you feel as though you are one of the luckiest female athletes on this planet? I do. I mean, and the fact that the WNBA has lasted, this will be the 24th season. So the fact that Lisa Leslie and I tipped off the first WNBA game and me scoring the first two points in franchise history, um, I feel extremely blessed. And now that I have a 15-year-old daughter who's quite a player, um, you know, I just feel blessed that she can look back on history and she can see, you know, that, wow, my mom was a part of that. And then to know that I'm I can be a mentor to her and to to the kids that she plays with and against and, and just a role model for girls and even the players, the current players right now. Right. What was it like for your family to finally see you play? Uh, it was it was really cool. I mean, uh, it was yeah. I mean, it was cool. Everyone was just so proud that because it was it was kind of like hearing. There, I mean, it's kind of like what you guys felt, what you felt like when you when your son got drafted. You know, it was right. kind of like that. So, uh, yeah, As, you know, everyone was just so proud. And my daughter plays in the WNBA. You know, they and you know, my daughter, you know, she's gonna be on TV today. You know, and stuff. And just when I would go home to Kentucky, and you know, like after the WNBA season and everything, and people were like. You know, we saw you in a game. Oh, man, we was working. you guys should have won the championship. Um, you know, and I mean, just so much feedback, you know. It was just amazing. And everyone was just so proud, you know, because they knew me and one of their own, you know, was there and made it. So, As a regular WNBA season usually runs from May to September. So what did you do during your off season? Um, well, for the first off season, I, I took off. The, the first half of the season abroad and um and I, I was doing appearances and uh just a lot of marketing stuff just appearances going on speaking engagements you know making doing television stuff uh you know just just you know just celebrity type stuff and uh and then I said okay I'm gonna go over the second half that way I can start getting in shape for the regular WNBA season so, um, and that's what I did. So that's how I ended up playing that half of the season. And then the next year, I was kind of like, okay, it's too much. And then plus, yeah. you know, I'd already played 12 years. You know, I was 36, you're going to be 37. I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to leave the Europe, you know, the European thing alone. It's too much. Like, you you started playing in the WNBA when most NBA players will retire. It's like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Cause girls, cause, cause girls rock. That's what we, we can do, do. Anything, yeah, yeah. We can do anything. You know? So, <laughs> being a female athlete is considerably different than a male yeah. for reasons such as pregnancy, family planning, and way more. Yeah. Was there a protocol in place when you played? Had a player become pregnant? Um, no. I mean, no one ever talked about it. You know, we don't. Yeah. But us as women we would just understand that, you know, we wouldn't try to mess up our money, but if it's something like that happened, it would just happen. You know, I mean, Skylar Dickens right. played, she just got pregnant, you know, during the season or right before it or, you know, whatever, I can't remember, but she played through it, you know, so, um, you know, it's, it's never been anything said about it. So, 
you played a great three seasons with the Liberty. And then unfortunately, due to a knee injury, you retired. After 15 years of playing ball, were you at that point ready to start a new chapter in your life? Yeah, um, I was. Um, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's tough to maintain that level of conditioning and, you know, me being 30, you know, 37, I think I was going to turn 38 when I retired. And, um, you know, it, it's tough. And you have all these young kids coming fresh out of college that are tall and athletic and <laughs> everything. <laughs> and, I, and I, you know, so having to maintain that level, I think mentally and physically, it, it just started to wear on me. And then also um, my knee, like the, the cartilage in my in my uh, right knee had just se- was severely worn. And so then I started having the issues where I couldn't practice every day because if not, then I wouldn't be ready for the game or my knee would be swollen or sore. And, and so, and then when you miss practices and you miss games and things like that, then you're not in as good a condition as you could be. And so, um, you know, I just, it was time. Okay. Well, you're still involved today with the New York Liberty Organization. What do you do? Uh, I work in um, community relations. Uh, I do go out and do a lot of uh, appearances for them. I do speaking engagements. I go to schools and uh, go show up at events and do appearances. Sometimes if they have clinics out in the community, uh, they usually do a lot of community relations stuff building up to the season and during the season. But because it's a long eight-month off-season, they don't do too much work right after the season. But, you know, once, you know, February gets around, so I do a lot of stuff, you know, in between, I would say, from October and then through October, and then um, it kind of dies off a little bit, and then it picks back up in January and February, so. Okay. It's very fair to say and common knowledge that the salaries of a WNBA player and an NBA player are extremely different. A lot of WNBA yeah. players have to play in Europe during the off season to supplement their income, which also puts them at risk for injuries. Plus, there's really no opportunity for rest. There's the travel to and from games that are not the same, where NBA players fly private, WNBA, uh, they fly commercial and more. So January of this year, there was a new collective bargaining agreement that was negotiated that is supposed to start this season through to 2027. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, it's, you know, I feel very proud that, um, you know, Kathy Engelberg, who happens to be the uh, Engelberg, mm-hmm. um, she's the new WNBA commissioner. Um, right. She was a, and, and she's the first WNBA commissioner that was a collegiate athlete, but she played basketball as well. So, uh, I'm, I'm grateful that she and Adam Silver, Mark Tato, you know, and all of the NBA, the NBA family, plus the Players Association, uh, the Women's Basketball Players Association, uh, and who else? I mean, the players themselves, and just any, everyone that had something to do with this agreement. I'm, I'm grateful that everyone um, got together and 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 just agreed on what was fair, what was positive, and and just moving in the right direction, I think. But this had to happen because, honestly, I kind of felt like the WNBA was just more of a upper echelon college, collegiate league. Um, I really didn't get the feeling that it was a professional league, you know, because, like you said, we had to fly commercial. And the reason we had to fly commercial, too, just to, you know, because people might not know, is because some organizations would have let their teams, the when the WNBA teams fly and utilize the private jet, the team jet, but others may not have been able to afford it or may not have. So it would have been advantageous to teams that couldn't. So I remember um, us, for example, uh, we made it to the semifinals the first year at WNBA, and James Dolan, who owns the Knicks, he allowed us to fly down to Charlotte to play our game on the mixed jet. And we were blown away. We thought we were on Air Force One. It was like, <laughs> you know, the, the, the food was amazing. It was just, I mean, it was, an, I was like, oh, my God, these guys are so lucky. Oh, my goodness, you know. 
the bathroom was huge. I was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. <laughs> Marble top, you know, and stuff. I was like, okay. But, um, and so somehow the media found out and everything, and, and the league found out. And so we got in trouble. And so here we are having to fly back on commercial flight the next morning and fly out, you know, at the same time with the Charlotte team because we had a back-to-back. So we played them in Charlotte that night, and then the next night we had to play them in New York. And, you know, so, uh, and our team got fined. So, uh, you know, so it, it's stuff like that. But I'm just really glad that this new collective bargaining, a collective bargaining agreement has just really improved in a lot of areas. Number one, on the financial level, because of the former collective bargaining agreement uh, I think maximum salary is like 115, something like 115 and 117. And now it's moved up to like 215. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, and the, and the minimum salary has definitely moved up as well. So that's, you know, one one of the great things that has happened. And then enhanced travel standards. So, you know, they might be flying a little bit better. Maybe some players can fly first class or you know, or get upgrades to, to just make the, the experience a little bit better. Um, you know, have stuff like you know, expanded career development opportunities. And then, but one of the great things is, is um, the new child care and maternity and, and uh, like progressive family planning benefits that they have. Women will be paid, even if they get pregnant, will get paid a full salary for the year, you know, and things like that. And then if you already have children, there's like a Five thousand dollars stipend that you get for the year right. for each year, um, you'll automatically get a two-bedroom apartment in the city that you play in if you have children. And, you know, so all of those wonderful things uh, have been added. And so, uh, you know, I, I definitely think that they're moving in the right direction. So yes, me tell me, too. Kim, if you had a wish list for the WNBA, what would be on it? Um, I I think, of course. Um, that each team, that the WNBA in general, uh, could could build a lasting and uh, fan base, just uh, a loyal fan base. I mean, I look at the New York Knicks. The New York Knicks are one of the worst teams in the league as far as record this year, but they sell out still pretty much every game. So um, I think if if we could create or generate fan, a fan base that mm-hmm. – is loyal, they understand the game, and they understand that you have to love the organization. Of course, you can love your players, but players, organizations will trade players or cut players or whatever. But just if we could get fans that are loyal to the game, um, that's one of, that's on my wish list. Uh, of course, that women can make more, um, substantially more money uh, doing what they love to do. Uh, of course, just having big TV deals where women can play on television and, and having marketing opportunities and current and former players, uh, just having, um, you know, those opportunities. And the NBA has already started uh, a program that allows former NBA and WNBA players to come in. It's kind of like an internship for a year. They have to relocate if you don't, if you're not living in New York, but you have to Move to New York, and it pretty much for a solid year, you learn the ins and outs of, of front office business of basketball and the coaching side of basketball. And it has a hundred percent placement for participants. And um, you know, so if you're interested in the front office, and that's why so many women now are in the front office, like Swing Cash. You know, I think she's vice president with Pelicans. And Teresa Weatherspoon, my former teammate, she is one of the assistant coaches, and she works in player development there at the Pelicans. And you have four or five other females that are on the coaching staff. My former teammate is um, Becky Hammond as well, who was the first assistant coach, female assistant coach in, in, in an NBA program with the San Antonio Spurs. And so, you know, that program, is if, if players want to get into coaching, this is the program Um that will um, help them to do that. So, you know, it's definitely improving all the way around. You have been a part of the WNBA since its inception. So tell me, how do you think the league has evolved from your day one up until today? 
Oh, definitely. Well, the skill set, the level, the skill set has gotten better with the players. Uh, players are so much more athletic and so much more skilled in in um, what they do. Uh, they're, you know, bigger, stronger, faster. Um, I think the IQ of the game uh, has improved as well. Um, as far from a league standpoint, um, it's definitely gotten better because, of course, the, the longer you have something, there are a lot of areas that have improved. But, but you know, we still have a long way to go, and it's right. going to take the part of, of everyone, the players, the, the league, the teams, the fans. You know, it's going to take everyone doing their part. Um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, things have all come to a halt, especially where you are in New York, um, where you have right now the most cases. So first, how are you handling it? And two, are you in touch with any of the players? Um, yeah, I've, I've talked to a few of my teammates and, and I'm, I'm handling it pretty good. You know, we're staying in for the most part. I mean, I've only had to go out, you know, two or three times just to, you know, make a grocery run or something like that. But I went out on Monday. I got out pretty early to so that I could get out and get in, hopefully to avoid, you know, large crowds. But, um, and, you know, now we're really staying in these, this, you know, this week, next week, because we're supposed to be in the apex right now. So, um, right. you know, we're, we're handling it for my daughter. It was, it was pretty tough, you know, because you're used to a kid that goes out to school and they go to practice and they have games, you know, there, and then they have to stay in the house. So it was tough for her, but you know, one of the great things is they're doing, you know, their school online, but also her AAU coach, um, they have workouts. So they might have to wake up at 7 a.m. and do a yoga workout or a stretching workout. And then in the evening, they get on at 6 o'clock and they might have CrossFit or ball handling or something in their virtual workout. So they'll have one of the coaches doing stuff and putting them through, telling them what to do next. Or they have, you know, former college or professional players come on uh, and they, that, you know, the, the kids can ask them questions about, you know, their journey and what it's like. So, uh, you know, other than that, you know, I'm handling it pretty good. Um, for me, work-wise, it has completely shut me down. <laughs> I mean, because all of my work is pretty much in the mm -hmm. community. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a speaker, I'm a singer, and I just, so everything that I do, I have to be in the eye of the public. So that's the tough and scary part for me. Uh, but I've been writing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a book. And so uh, just, just trying to meditate a lot more and just get quiet and, and get still. Uh, you know, this is one of the great times. I, I, I've been telling everybody, this is an, a wonderful time for everyone to really just pull back and just start thinking about what's going to be our new now, because, things are different and, and I've learned uh, now it's, it's taught me baby you have to have more than one stream of income you know you go, you're going to have to get, get multiple streams of income and you're going to have to do something that's going to make you money even while you sleep because this right here it you know thank god it's a national thing oh, excuse right. me a global thing no I'm yes. not thanking god <laughs> for it but I'm saying thank god in the sense that this is a global thing that, you know, mortgage companies right. and, and, and car, everyone is lenient because they understand so many people have lost their jobs because of this. They're unable to be out, you know, so, but I'm just like, whew, it's just eye opening. So just trying to get myself ready and prepared. So when this thing lifts up, um, I can hit the ground running. I've been, you know, speaking with, you know, my agent, the people that represent me, and we're talking about, you know, the proposing different opportunities, and I'm saying yes to everything. So, yeah. So, with that said, you are a singer, model, author, actress. I mean, you want to come to And still involved with the Liberty. You became a mom at the age of 41. Your former school, Arizona State University, retired your number 32 jersey. And you do appearances at kids' uh, basketball events, particularly girls, which is actually where you and I met in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> let's talk about your music career a bit. You sang the national anthem at games. You are a performer at heart. Um, and you're currently doing a tribute to the great late jazz singer Nancy Wilson. So tell me about this project and what does it mean to you? 
Well, I've always loved to sing. Singing was my first passion, my first love. Um, and and so, um, it was, but I was really shy. And so I had stage fright. But when karaoke kind of came along back in the, you know, like the late 80s or whatever, that was what got me through and what made me or gave me the courage to not only work on my craft, but um, just to give me the courage to stand up and do it. So um, when the WNBA happened, you know, it was just an opportunity to, to do so much. I mean, at halftime of one of our games on, on CBS, um, they did a special, a feature on me. They set it up where I was going and I was singing a club where it was live people and they were filming. I mean, it was amazing. And, and then they did the interviews and everything. And, and so it was wonderful. And so just getting an opportunity to live that dream has been amazing for me. And I've always loved the great singers and great music and, and jazz for whatever reason has, has always resonated with me. So um, Nancy, she's so smooth and eloquent, you know, and just beautiful. And so, uh, just her, you know, she's a stylist and, and just her inflections and, and the way she sings, you feel every emotion of a song. And so just for me, I, I, Save Your Love for Me, um, uh, was one of the songs that she did with Cannonball Adderley. And I fell in love with that song. So I started singing it. And then I got the idea, I should do a tribute to her when she passed, you know? So I was like, gosh, I should do a tribute to her. And so uh, I started putting it together and started learning some songs. But, you know, I'm thinking I'm just going to learn some songs and sing some songs, you know, and stuff. But when I started listening to her and started listening to her interviews online, because I not only am I singing her songs, I'm um, educating the audience. I'm teaching them who Nancy Wilson was, where she came right. from, you know, how her life, what happened. So, um, you know, it was just eye opening when I started listening and I mean, listening in depth to who she was as an artist, when she sang songs, like you almost get engulfed, you know, into, you know, like you, I felt like you kind of, you can become her by listening to a song and paying attention to a song. Like you are singing the emotion of that song. You know, it's almost like acting. And that's what she said. You know, she honed her craft in acting because she did it every night on stage because when she, whatever song she was singing, that's who she was, you know? So it's been a wonderful experience to not only share her music and share who she was as, as a woman, as an artist, but, to actually um, dip it, or tap into um, that type of artistry has just been wonderful. So we, li- we wish you luck on this tribute that you're doing um, for her and all the very best. Kim, you. you truly put a different twist in talent and your career is absolutely aspirational and I thank you so much for sharing. You are definitely someone that little girls and female athletes should look up to as your life is empowering and we thank you so much for coming on the Courtside Moms. I really, really appreciate you. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much, Wendy. I wish you the best. And as a mother, you know, I wish you much success with your son. And you continue to be a role model for uh, for mothers like yourself um, for for these athletes because we are strong women. I mean, we raised our children, but um, it's always super yeah. important for us to be our best and to to make sure we continue to grow and to be. Uh, who we were created to be as well. So I, I, I commend you. I take my hat off to you and applaud you for, you know, starting this podcast. Congratulations Aww. to you as well. Thank you so, so much. And we will definitely keep in touch because we're going to have to go to Nova Scotia and have a good lobster together. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right. You take care. You too. Thank you. You want done, baby?